Evo 10 versus STI versus Focus RS versus Golf R versus New Golf R versus Audi Quattro. In this video, we're talking about all-wheel drive systems, what each of them do, and the advantages and disadvantages of each one. The first thing I wanna do in this video is go over a few ground rules or terms that I'm gonna be saying that you may be familiar with, you may not be familiar with. Starting off with the most basic, we're gonna have an open differential. This is the kind of differential where the power is gonna be sent to the actual unit itself and distributed evenly among each wheel. In the event where one wheel loses traction, all the power is gonna be sent to the other wheel. Not very ideal. The second is the other most extreme, a locking differential. This is where the power is split to both wheels all the time, regardless of if one of them is spinning or not. The other type of differential is a limited slip differential. And as the name suggests, once one of the wheels starts to slip, it starts to send the power to the other wheel. It does this with a mechanical clutch pack. Moving on to vectoring, there's two different main types of vectoring. There's torque vectoring, where more power is applied to one of the wheels, and then there's brake vectoring, which basically means that you're putting the brakes on one of the wheels in order to add power to the other wheel. A torque vectoring system is a more performance-oriented system, but as a downside, it has more moving parts and more room for failure. A brake vectoring system, on the other hand, has less moving parts and utilizes the car's existing technology to make the most of it. The main advantage that torque vectoring has over brake vectoring, though, is that instead of reducing one of your wheel speeds, you're actually increasing the other wheel speed. As a result, a brake vectoring system might take off a little bit of speed as you're entering a turn or in a turn compared to a torque vectoring system. So for each car, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over what front differential they have, what center differential they have, and what rear differential they have. Starting off with the Evo. So in the case of the Evo, the front differential is a helical style torsion differential. While it's not a true limited slip differential, it does even out how the torque gets distributed among the wheels to allow the wheel that's slipping to send 80% of its power to the wheel that's not slipping. As for the center differential in the Evo, can actually split the power from 40-60 to 60-40. And in the rear is really where the magic happens in the Evo. Over here, we have an active yaw control system. What this is gonna do is actually take all the power that's sent to the back and can send 100% of the power to either wheel. It does this with overdriven planetary gear sets on both sides of the differential. When it senses one of the wheels slipping, it'll engage one of those clutch packs to overdrive the wheel with grip. This will help you power out of a turn. One of the advantages of this system in the Evo dramatically improves its cornering capabilities, but one of the drawbacks is that there's a lot more moving parts and parts that corrode over time, which make it quite a costly repair when it comes time to do that. Moving on to the WRX STI. Over here, we have the same front differential as the Evo 10, and a similar active center differential as the Evo 10 as well. In this case, you can control how much you lock the center differential. When the center differential is fully unlocked, it sends 35% to the front and 65% to the back. When you lock it up to 100%, It'll now send 50% to the front and 50% to the back. As for the rear differential, it is a torsion style LSD. Now to spice things up, Subaru's also added a brake vectoring system where it will apply the brakes to the wheel that's spinning to send more power to the wheel that's not spinning. This brake vectoring paired up with the torsion differential in the rear really makes a nice little combo. Moving on, we have the Focus RS. This is honestly kind of a mixing pot between the Evo, the STI and the Golf R. So basically what's going on here? Over here, we have a Quay front differential, which is essentially a helical limited slip, the same as the Evo, the same as the STI, except we're introducing a Haldex-based system. Haldex is a company that was formed in the late 90s, which had a goal of decoupling the front and rear axle. In a traditional Haldex system, once there is slippage that is noticed on the front axle, it'll start to send power to the rear axle up until it's fully locked. When it's fully locked, about 50% of the power gets sent to the rear and 50% of the power gets sent to the front. But Ford wasn't happy with this. So what they did is they actually overdrove the rear end to make it so that you can send 70% to the back. This is how the Focus RS is able to achieve the kind of drift mode it does when it's paired along with the AYC system that it also has. This is kind of where it relates to the Evo in a sense, because instead of having a hydraulically driven active yaw control, it has an electronically driven active yaw control. Moving on, we have the Mark 7 Golf R. Similarly to the Focus RS, it also has a Haldex based system. This is paired up with a open differential in the front and an open differential in the rear. And like Subaru, they take advantage of brake vectoring. This system is called XDS Plus. And what it'll do once again is start to apply the brakes to the wheel that doesn't have traction, 
which will in turn send that power to the wheel that does have traction. As XDS Plus states, this is a system that allows the car to smoothly enter a turn. A couple years ago, Volkswagen introduced the Mark 8 Golf R, which relates a little bit more to the Focus RS and the Evo. In this scenario, it still kind of does have a hall deck system, but not at the same time. What it does is the engine and transmission are actually permanently coupled to the rear axle and the front axle. Except what it has is clutch packs in the rear differential on each side that can decouple the rear wheels individually at any given time. So what this does is that when you're cruising along, the car is 100% front wheel drive. When you start to floor it as it needs, it will can send the power to either wheel individually or all four at the same time, making the car essentially a perfect 50-50. But now in the scenario where you want to enter drift mode, it'll send 100% of that rear torque to the wheel that you are turning against. What this will do is spin up the wheel with grip and not spin up the wheel without grip. That'll help send the car into a slide. Furthermore, in the front, like I said, it has an open differential, which also takes advantage of brake vectoring, similarly to the other cars. Now we move on to the most infamous, the Quattro Systems. The father of the all-wheel drive. <laughs> Personally, I think the main misconception with Quattro is that it's a good all-wheel drive system, but it got its stigma from being great at the time. It's not that impressive anymore. So basically, back in 1995, Quattro consisted of a torsion-style helical center differential. This was able to smoothly send power to the front and the back, but it was also paired with an open differential in the front and an open differential in the back combined with brake vectoring. This is very similar in a sense to the Mark 7 Golf R, except it has a center differential, which is permanently coupled. It's still a pretty solid all wheel drive system, but I don't know if it compares to some of the other cars on the list. Now in 2010, with the RS5 as an example, there's the new generation of Quattro. This has a crown style torsion LSD as a center differential, which Audi says can send up to 85% of the power to the back as needed. This is once again paired up with open differentials in the front and the back, with brake vectoring. So on the screen, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put all seven all-wheel drive systems that we went over in this video, and I'm gonna to try to include the same symbols in each one that are related to each other, just to help make everything more coherent and understandable. So I'm gonna go put that up on the screen right now. I'll leave the video going on for a little bit so you can compare them side by side. Hope you guys found this video informative and helpful and hopefully it answered any questions you may have had with any of the cars in this video. I'm not going to be talking about which preferences I have. I just wanted to go over exactly what the all-wheel drive systems are in all of these popular models and I'll let you guys decide which are best suited for your applications. Each of them has their advantages. Some of them are more performance oriented. Some of them are more cost oriented. Some of them break down more. Some of them don't break down as much. All of them kind of balance out and have their own pluses and minuses.